our first problem if x plus 4 and 2 fifths is equal to 10, which will give the value of x? And we have the options right there. We will not bother to go through them. We are going to actually solve the problem on our own and then see how our solution matches with any of the options that we have there. In order to get the value of x, we need to get rid of of the mixed number from the left hand side. Now if we need the value of x, 4 and 2 fifths, that mixed number is added to the x on the left hand side. So we need to remove that 4 and 2 fifths. What do we do? Since it is added on that side, we are going to subtract that 4 and 2 fifths from the left hand side. We are working with an equation. So whatever we do to one side or whatever we do to the left hand side, we also have to do that to the right hand side as the equation will not remain balanced. The correct answer is therefore option A. But let us first take the 4 and 2 fifths from the right hand side also. Right. So the correct option is what? Option A. So we're going to subtract 4 and 2 fifths from both sides of the equation. And the correct answer is option A. However, where students are sometimes defeated is let us go back to the other slide and see. Right there. Because after subtracting the 4 and 2 fifths from the left hand side, x is the only thing that is left on that side. So the net effect is that the net effect is that 4 and 2 fifths is subtracted from the right hand side. So some students will jump and say, subtract 4 and 2 fifths from the right hand side. And they imagine that that will be the correct answer. That is not the correct answer because that is not the approach that we have taken. It is just the end result. So because the end result causes the solution to appear as if 4 and 2 fifths are being subtracted from the right hand side, we need to understand that. It is not the process by which we arrive at the answer. It is the answer, but it is not the process by which we arrive at it. To arrive at the answer, we need to subtract 4 and 2 fifths from both sides. We arrive at the answer by taking the step by which we subtract 4 and 2 fifths from both sides of the equation. The correct answer is therefore option A and that we have seen already. In a school, the ratio of boys to girls is 9 to 11. What percentage of the children is girls? So what percentage we are working with now? Percentages. We may think of the first number in the ratio as indicating that the total number of boys is divided into 9 equal parts. So we are going to treat the ratio as if this represent this total number of boys and that it can be that total number can be divided into nine equal parts or we can call them units and we are going to think that the second number in the ratio is indicating that the total number of girls is divided into 11 equal parts so we have nine equal parts on one side and 11 equal parts on the other side With all units being equal, the percentage of girls is a fraction of the number of units of girls to the total number of units. So the percentage of girls is going to be what? The fraction, we're going to use the fraction of what? The total number of girls to the total number of 
students or children overall. So the total number of units, 9 plus 11 equals 20, and the percentage of girls should be what? 11 over 20 multiplied by 100. There's a common factor in the numerator and denominator. And that common factor is 20. So, let us do that. 20 and 100. So, 20 into 20 is 1. And 20 into 100 is 5. So, the result is that 11 is multiplied by 5. And the, the answer is 55%. The answer is therefore option B. Michael ate 20 of the 70 gummy bears that were in a bag. Well, it had to be Michael. If it were Jerry, Jerry would have eaten all 70 of them. If the remaining gummy bears were shared equally between Pam and Roy, how many would each of them get? So, if Michael ate 20 of the 70 gummy bears, this means that 20 are taken away from 70. So we have 50. We now need to share the 50 remaining gummy bears between Pam and Roy. And that is the share is going to be equally. So this is done by dividing 50 by 2. And the answer is 25. And this is represented by option C. The cashier gave Bob $20.01 for his change after he paid for an item that cost $29.99. So how much money did Bob give the cashier? We may think of Bob's encounter with the cashier as dependent on an equation in which the cashier subtracted the cost of the item from the amount of money given to her. Of course, that's what is going to happen. The cashier is going to subtract the amount of money that the item cost from the amount of money that is given to her by Bob. And the result is going to be the change. So the money minus the price of the item is equal to the change. And that's an equation that we are going to be using. The money, we do not know. The change, we have there as, as what? The change is $20.01. And of course, what is the price? The cost of the item is $29. 99 so that is the price is going to be taken away from the money that Bob gives to the cashier and the change is the result that we have right there so we need to determine the amount of money to find out the amount of money that Bob gave the cashier we need to add 29.99 to both sides of the equation generally if we want to solve the equation to find out the amount of money, the figure that we have subtracting here means that in order to eliminate this from the left hand side, we need to add 29.99 to the left hand side. And if we add 29.99 to the left, we will have to add 29.99 to the right also. So, we have added 29.99 to both sides. But what is going to happen on the left hand side? There is another term for you now. We have a negative 29.99 here and we add 29.99 there. These two numbers have the same numerical value but the signs that we have here are different. They are therefore called additive inverses. So, when additive inverses come together, they eliminate each other. So on the left hand side, we'll just have money alone. And on the right hand side, 
the result or the net effect is going to be shown on that right hand side which is 20.01 plus 29.99 we therefore need to add 20.01 plus 29.99. Of course, the answer is equal to $50. And that is represented by option B. But how do we add the 20.01 and the 29.99 to ensure that our answer is 50? So let us see how the figures in the last problem may be added. Add the numbers in the hundreds column first, as usual. 1 plus 9 is equal to 10. We write down the 0 and we carry 1. So 9 plus 1 now is 10 again. So we write down the 0 and we carry 1. The point will be placed vertically below the other points. Right there. Next, add the numbers in the ones column. So we are going to add them 0, carry 1. What do we have here in the tens column now? 1 plus 2 plus 2. So add the numbers in the tens column. 1 plus 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. So that's our 50. That's how we arrive at it. What about the dollar sign? It goes right there. So $50. One pencil and three books cost $35. If one of the books cost $10, what is the cost of the pencil? Well, if one book costs $10, then three similar books will cost three times as much. So the total cost of the book will therefore be what? 3 multiplied by 10 and that will be $30. The cost of the entire package is $35. All the books together cost $30. The remainder of the money is the cost of the pencil. So 35 minus 30 is equal to $5. And that's the cost of the pencil and that is represented by option C. If three banjos cost the same as two guitars, how many guitars cost the same as nine banjos? This problem may be solved by using ratios on principle. However, it may be shown to be simpler than first imagined. Write the number of banjos to the number of guitars as a ratio. Three banjos, two guitars. Write another ratio with the number of banjos that we now know to be nine and the number of guitars that we do not know, we can call that X. So, 9 banjos to X guitars. We do not need a long calculation. We may ask the question, what do we do with the 3 in order to get 9? Now notice what we have here. The ratios are the same. We have 3 here, 9 there. How do we go from 3 to 9? We may say 3 plus 6 will be equal to 9. But 6 just not going to be correct because when we are working with ratios multiplication and division are usually the two appropriate operations addition and subtraction does not really figure so as a matter of fact we say 3 multiplied by 3 and that will give 9 so we actually multiply 3 by 3 to get 9 so whatever we do from 3 to get to 9 we do from 2 to get to x. The answer is multiply by 3. We therefore do the same to 2. So 2 multiplied by 3 is equal to 6. The answer is option A. 6 plus 3 is equal to 9 also. However, 
when working with ratios, the multiplication and division operation are more appropriate than addition and subtraction. So which of the units is largest? This is not one of that question that requires any figuring out. We need to make use of our knowledge of our metric table. So the milli is going to be the smallest and the largest is going to be the kilo. According to the information that we have in the table, the largest unit is kilogram and it is represented by option C. By this presentation right here, students may also make use of the fact that the scale goes from the smallest to the largest. So centigram is larger than decigram and we get larger progressively. So if we need to come to a conclusion, we may say that decagram is larger than decigram. So the largest is kilogram and that is represented by option C. What is 32.05 grams minus 29.96 grams? We have a lovely subtraction problem on our hands. To begin with, we cannot take 6 from 5. So we go to the 10th column. There is a 0 in the 10th column. So we move to the ones column. We rename the two by subtracting one and the result is one. So we are going to take one from there. One is going to go right there. The one is taken to the the tenth column. The ten in the tenth column is also renamed. Now we can do our subtraction. 15 minus 6 is equal to 9. Then 9 minus 9 is equal to 0. Then the point, I'm not going to forget this one, will go vertically below the points that are there already. And now we cannot take 9. From one. So we go to the tens column and rename three. So now we can say nine from eleven or eleven minus nine is equal to two. Two minus two is equal to zero. Of course, we may put the zero, but we may also neglect that. It's not a complete necessity. The zero is not necessary. The answer is therefore option D. So which unit best describes the area of an island in the West Indies? This is a question that requires us to make use of our knowledge of the units used to measure area. A hectare is equal to 10,000 square meters. A good approximation to a hectare is the total area in which athletes perform during a track and field event like the recently concluded Olympics. There are many very small islands in the West Indies for which this would be an appropriate unit to measure the areas. However, for larger islands, this would not be used. So if the islands are very, very, very small, like some that we have in the West Indies, we may use hectares. But of course, you'll have a lot of hectares, but it may be used. But in general, cannot be used. A square centimeter is the size of one of those intermediate squares on a graph paper. That surely would not be used. So we would not dare use a square centimeter to measure the size of any island in the Caribbean. A hectare 
is 10,000 square meters. If it is not appropriate, then square meter is 10,000 times less likely to be used. So if the hectare is 10,000 square meters, can't use that or shouldn't use that, then you would not use a unit that is 10,000 times less. So we would not use square meters either. Square kilometer would be the appropriate unit as it will not only cater for the very small islands but also large islands like Jamaica. Option D is correct. We need to m multiply 5 hours and 50 minutes by 3. Of course, we are going to multiply the 50 minutes by 3 first. So 3 times 50 is 150. That's what we have right there. So that value of 150 should not be placed in that minutes position there. Because 60 minutes make an hour. So as long as it gets to an hour, we need to indicate we have arrived at the number of minutes that is required for an hour by putting one unit in the hours column. So we have 150, so we need to know how many hours that will be. So we divide 150 by 60 because we need to know, of course, 150 is not going to be appropriate right there. But we need to know how many hours is this going to be equivalent to. If we can determine the number of hours that this one is equivalent to, we'll put the numbers of hours there. If any minute remains, we are going to put that in the minutes column. So 150 divided by 60 is equal to 2 and the remainder is 30. So 30 is going to be placed in the minutes column and 2 is going to be placed in the hours column. Like that. Then we are going to say 3 times 5 is equal to 15. And there is an additional 2 that was carried over from the minutes column. And that extra 2 is added to the 15. And that's 17. So our final answer is 17 hours and 30 minutes. So that answer is option A. Now we'll see how 60 is divided into 150 and our answer will be 2 times and remainder 30. Of course, we are going to begin by saying first 60 into 1. Of course, we cannot do that. So we're going to go to the, the other and say what? 60 into 15. And we cannot do that either. So we are going to go now and say 60 into 150. So 150 divided by 60 is equal to 2. So we are going to put that 2 right there. We have to put the 2 over this one. Why? Because we started here. 60 into 1 cannot. 60 into 15 cannot. Then we have to go right down to the end. So that is why the 2 is appropriately placed over that 0. And of course, in true long division form, we are going to say 2 times 60, and that is going to give us 120. So we are going to subtract 120 from 150. And we get 30. And that's why we have 2 times and remainder 30. What is 6,850 grams represented in grams? So let us take a look at the part of the metric table that pertains to the question asked. Right, we are in milligram and we want 
it in grams. So we are going to do a little trick here now. Notice that the units are all multiplied by 10 on the left hand side. If all of the units on that side were in milligram, we would have to increase it to 100 then to 1000. So then if we had milligram right here, we have 10 milligram is equal to 1 centigram. So how many milligram would be equal to 1 decigram? So that would be 100. And down here now, how many milligram would make a gram? A thousand. Right, so that is what we have. So we may therefore see that 1000 milligram is equal to 1 gram. Since the number of milligram, 1000, is greater than the number of grams, which is 1, in converting from milligram to gram, we divide by 1000. Now, some students are confused whether to multiply or divide. Now, just look at this. 1000 milligram is equal to 1 gram. Therefore, if you have milligrams and your answer must be in grams, then you will have to divide because the number on the milligram side is always greater than the number on the gram side. If you have a number given to you in milligrams, to go over to this side means that you will have to get a smaller number for your answer, so you will have to divide. And of course, if it is in grams and it should go over to the milligram side, you will have to multiply by a thousand. So now that we have milligram right there and we want grams. So if we want grams, what do we do? We are going to divide by a thousand. To divide any number by one thousand, we need to reduce it by three decimal places. Remember that in a number that does not contain a decimal point, the decimal point is always assumed to be at the extreme right. Right there, the extreme right of the number. So we are going to reduce this number in size by three decimal places. So count the number of decimal places to be divided by 1, 2, 3. Mark the new position of the decimal point relative to the digits. With the digit at the end of the number being insignificant, the answer is option B. The mass of a man is 85 kilogram. If he loses 5 and 1 fifth kilogram, what will be his approximate mass? We are going to take two approaches to the problem. The first one is based purely on calculations. So let us first take away 1 from 85. Why? Because taking away this 1 from 85, we are going to cause the operation to work with this fraction that we have here. So from the 85 we take 1, we are going to have 84. And that 1 now, of course, we are going to write that 1 as a fraction with the same denominator as this one. So the 1, which is one whole that is taken away from the 85 is going to be written as a fraction. But I just want to bring to your attention that 1 is what? 3 divided by 3 or 4 divided by 4 or 5 divided by 5. Therefore, 1 is equal to 3 thirds, 4 quarters, and 1 is also equal to 5 fifths. Right? So let us take 1 fifth from 1. So if we're going to take away 1 fifth from 1, don't forget that 1 is what? 5 fifths. So 5 fifths minus 1 fifth, that is equal to 4 fifth. So, we have taken a 1 
from the 85 and we are left with 84 is that right yes we are left with 84 and the one that we have taken we have taken away one fifth from it and the result is four fifth so what do we have now the four fifths is added to the 84 that remains so the 84 is added to the four fifths so in all we have 84 and four fifths so we finally take the whole number five from the result so if we have 84 and 4 fifth and we are going to take away 5 from that what do we have left take away the 5 from the 84 and we have 79 so the result is 79 and 4 fifths so this number is between 79 and 80 but very much closer to 80 than 79 therefore the answer is option C So let us do a little revision of this. We are going to take away a 1 from the 85. And that is going to be left with 84. The 1 that is left, we are going to take the 1 fifth from it. 1 from 1 fifth from 1 is going to give 4 fifths. So we are going to have 84 and 4 fifths. From 84 and 4 fifths, we are going to take away 5. So subtracting 5 from 84 and 4 fifths, we are going to be left with 79 and 4 fifths. And that is very much closer to 80 than to 79. So the approximate value is 89, and that is represented by option C. The other approach that we can take is this. And of course, this second approach is based on common sense. If we are dealing with approximation, 5 and 1 fifth is approximately equal to 5 if we are talking about approximation. So, we are going to subtract that 5 from 85 and the result is 80. That's all there is to it. So, the answer is there for option C. We have done that without much calculation. So let us revise that. This second approach will be based on common sense more than anything else. If we are dealing with approximation, 5 and 1 fifth is approximately equal to 5. So we are going to just subtract that 5 from 85 and the result is 80. And that's all there is to it. If the pointer were to be moved 20 units in the direction of the arrow, what would be the resulting position? So here we have the arrow and here we have the pointer. So the pointer is tri pointing straight across at 5. But we're going to move it down by 20 units and see what happens. So let us move the pointer down by 5 units each time. Why? Because of course we can see that the difference between these we have only 5 units. So let us move it 5 units each time. Counting until the result is 20. Now Jerry, when it comes to computer programming and counting, you are always late. So keep your eyes open now and make sure that when the counting starts, you are a part of it. So our position, beginning position, we have not moved as yet. So if we have not moved, that means we have moved zero unit. So we are at zero unit in terms of our movement. We, are, we have not moved as yet. So zero movement. All right, Jerry, let's take it back. So we're going to move by five units each time. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. The answer is negative 15, which corresponds with option C right there. The diameter of a circle is 15 centimeters. 
what can be used to find its radius. Of course, finding the radius is going to be dependent on uh, the relationship between the radius and the diameter. So, let's look at a circle and the relationship between its radius and diameter. That's your diameter. The diameter of a circle goes from one point on the circumference of the circle through the center to the other side. The radius goes from one point on the circumference to the center. The radius is therefore half of the diameter. Our radius is equal to the diameter divided by 2. And what is the diameter? The diameter is 15, so the radius is 15 divided by 2. And of course, that is represented by option C. This question is large. A boy attempted to measure the mass of a small amount of water. He puts a container in the balance then poured the water into the container. Of course, Jerry, you cannot put the water and the balance all by itself. You have to put it into a container. So, he put the container on the balance and then poured the water into it. The white pointer shows the position when the container alone was on the balance. And the black shows the position after the water was poured in. What is the approximate mass of the water? Yes, Jerry. Yes, Jerry. Put the container on the balance and take note of the mass. Then pour the water into the container and take note of the mass again. So the mass of the water is going to be the difference between those two masses. So how do we find that? Now we have two ways in which we can do that. So let us use our sophisticated way first. The mass of the water will be the difference in position between the two arrows. We will therefore start our counting at the position of the white arrow where we will assign position 0. And then we are going to count. And of course, you can see that it is moving by 10 units each time. So we are going to count by 10 each time. So we will count every subsequent position advancing by 10 units until we get to the position of the black arrow. 20, 30. So the answer is there for 30 gram, which is represented by option B. There it is. What about the easy way? Of course, one is at 50 gram and the other is at 20 gram. So you just subtract 20 from 50 and that's 30. And that's all there is to it. So which operation will represent 80 gram plus 60 gram expressed in kilogram? So let us take a look at the part of the metric table that pertains to the question asked, gram to kilogram. Of course, the units are always multiplied by 10 on the left hand side. But on the left hand side we have gram, decagram and hectogram. So if we replace all of those that are on the left hand side by a gram alone, instead of having 10 here, we'll have to have 100 gram. And then instead of having another 10, we'll have to go up by 10 again. So we'll have to have 1,000 right there. So we are only having 10 here because we are gram, decagram, hectogram. 
So if you go gram here, we'll have to use 100 grams. And then if we come here and use gram again, we'll have to use 1,000 grams. As indicated right there and right there. So 1,000 gram is equal to 1 kilogram. Notice that in the relationship between gram and kilogram, the number of gram is larger than the number of kilogram. To change grams into kilogram, we need to divide by 1,000. So if we are going to go from this side to this side, the number on this side is always smaller. So if we have a figure for gram and we want kilogram, since this figure on this side is always smaller, we'll have to divide. So that's what we're going to do. Right. First, add the number of grams. Of course, we're going to add that. No problem adding 80 plus 60. As a matter of fact, we do not have to know that 80 plus 60 is 140 because it is not a requirement as indicated by the options that we have right there. We then divide the result by 1000 because we are going to convert from grams to kilograms. So we are going to divide by 1000. And of course, we are going to divide the entire sum by 1000. So we have to enclose that in brackets. So the answer is option C. How? is 3 p.m. represented on the 24-hour clock. 3 is 3 hours afternoon. That is 3 p.m. is 3 hours afternoon. So 3 hours in the afternoon. So beginning at noon, show how the hours on both clocks are related to each other. Right. So for on the 24-hour clock, we have 12 for noon, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and 3 p.m. On the 24-hour clock, we have 12 for noon, 1,300 hours, 1,400 hours, and 1,500 hours. So locate 3 p.m. now. If we can find 3 p.m. on the 12-hour clock, then we have accompanying that the equivalent of 3 p.m. on the 24-hour clock. Right there. So our answer is option A. We may take another approach in which we begin at noon on the 24-hour clock and advance by 3 hours. Look at this one, Jerry. Because I know how slow you are at visualizing the information on the screen. So here's your 24 hour clock. So what do we do? We start at noon, which is 1200 hours. And what did we do? We advance by one hour until we have completed three hours. So let's do that again. Good. No one can blend you, Jerry. This verifies that option A is correct. What is the width of the small rectangle labeled W? So the width is labeled W and is the width of the small rectangle that we have right there. The width of the large Rectangle is equal to 7 cm on one side and the combination of W and 5 cm on the other side. So, what we have here as 7 for the width here, we have 5 here and W. So, that's the combination that we have. This combination, 5 and W, is equal to that 7 that we have there. And of course, we can put those closer so we can see them with our naked eyes. Therefore, 
if we take off the 5 cm portion from the 7 cm, the value of W is what is left. So W is equal to 7 minus 5, and of course, W is equal to 2 cm. The answer is option A. So now we need to find the perimeter of the shaded region, which of course is the small rectangle. What is perimeter? The measurement around, and it is written in a special way for rectangles. So we therefore go straight ahead and find the perimeter. The perimeter is going to be what? Dependent on this length and the width that we have there is 2 centimeters. So use the formula for perimeter which is perimeter is equal to 2 times length plus width. Of course not 2 times length but 2 times the combination or the sum of the length and the width. So L is equal to 6, that is the length is 6 centimeters, we have it right there, and the width is 2 centimeters right there. In algebra or arithmetic, we generally do the operation that we have in the brackets first. So we have 6 plus 2 is 8, so we are going to do 2 times 8. When a number precedes another inside of a bracket, the arithmetic operation that is assumed is multiplication. So the perimeter is 2 times 8 and that is equal to 16. The answer is option D. A train traveled at a speed of 120 kilometers per hour. How far did it travel? in three hours. The version of the formula that relates speed, distance and time that most students remember is the one that we are going to write below right here. So speed is equal to distance over time. We need to find distance so let us place the portion with the distance and time on the left hand side. So let us just switch it around. That's all we are doing. We're just switching the equation around. Distance over time right there. And speed goes there. And of course that's the same equation. But we need to what? Find the distance which is how far the train traveled. We need to find the distance. It is being divided by time. Notice. Distance divided by time. We therefore need to multiply by time in order that it may be cancelled from the left hand side. The expression is an equation and what we do to one side we need to do to the other side. We need to multiply by time on the right also. So we are dividing by time right here and we need to eliminate time from the left hand side. So if we are dividing by what do we do? Or the opposite of division. The opposite of division is multiplication. Therefore, we are going to multiply by time in order that the time is going to be eliminated. But we have to multiply both sides by time because we have an equation and what we do to one side, we need to do to the other side also. So, right now, we are multiplying by time. So, on the left hand side, the time will cancel each other. Notice that we, are, we have a division by time here and a multiplication by time there. So, the effect is going to be cancelled on the left hand side. So, all that is left on the left hand side will be distance. And of course, the speed multiplied by time is going to be left on the right hand side. So, speed, let us look at this first. Distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. Speed is 120 km per hour and time is 3 hours. So all we need to do, multiply the speed by the time. So distance is equal to 120 multiplied by 3 and that gives 360 and that is represented by 
ऑप्शन बी